Good morning. My name is Dorota Stefanowicz and I'm a Research and Innovation Manager at Genome BC. Thank you for joining us for the last session called Preserving Our Planet, Genomic Engineering for Species Conservation. We're be, we'll be discussing the innovative genomic technologies scientists are using in the effort to preserve and protect our biodiversity. We're going to start the presentation with a presentation by Ben Novak. Ben is a proponent of biotech-based genetic rescue solutions for all organisms. He is a lead scientist at Revive and Restore, a wildlife conservation organization promoting the incorporation of biotechnologies into standard conservation practice. His work includes heading their de-extinction efforts and leading the coordination for conservation cloning projects. Recently, he expanded his role to include program manager for their newly launched Biotechnology for Bird Conservation program. Over to you, Ben. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, I was asked to give a brief presentation on Revive and Restore and the general idea of biotechnology for conservation. Um, and a quick disclaimer just right at the beginning is that for a hundred years now, over a hundred years, con the modern conservation movement has saved many species, restored habitats, and with enough hard work, sometimes decades of resources, conservation can make gains against human threats in nature. However, more and more right now, the problems of the spread of invasive species, emerging diseases and spread of disease, the loss of genetic diversity of populations and the threat of climate change are creating problems that conventional measures really struggle to, uh, to, to overcome. Collectively, the response to this biodiversity crisis, these conventional measures, the status quo as we call it, is many, many times not having the results that conservationists want. There is an inertia to adopt new techniques um, and continue trying approaches even if they keep failing, leading to a stagnation and the plateau of conservation success with some species becoming conservation reliant. And this large stagnation is causing socio-political barriers to continuing to get the job done, sometimes creating donor fatigue for organizations like uh, that rely on philanthropy or funding cuts from the government, regulatory challenges. And ultimately, if you can't overcome all of these issues, re retrying conventional approaches that aren't working lead to the worst outcome, extinction. At Revive and Restore, our theory of change is to implement what we call the Genetic Rescue Toolkit, a toolkit of biotechnologies that can lead to innovation and overcome these issues. We fund research and development for new biotechnology tools, as well as the application of existing tools. We're hoping that the projects we, spick, we pick will inspire more conservationists to adopt these tools. We are hoping this leads to a widespread adoption. This is why we convene the workshops that we convene and work in the space like we do right now, me talking to all of you, so that ultimately we can save species and restore ecosystems. That toolkit is made up of a variety of technologies. We view it as starting with genomics, basic genome sequencing, and other in the other omics collectively. Then building upon that, you can add in cell culture, stem cell research, biobanking, the in vitro technologies, basically. And moving on top of that, when you add in advanced reproductive techniques, you can start really thinking of doing a lot of cool stuff with these, this information and these tools. And adding on top of those gene editing, and genetic engineering, we might be able to do some really neat things like facilitated adaptation so that we can restore ecosystems ultimately. Just like the conventional tools aim to, all of these tools in the toolkit can add to that to reach the ultimate goal. And I mentioned a couple of these already, but basically these different types of tools can be used separately or together to achieve restoring diversity in ways that conventional tools never have been able to, facilitating adaptation and controlling invasive species all in completely new ways and hopefully at a scale that meets the pace of the threats that the environment faces. We have a number of projects in this space. Uh, we're currently funding around the world nearly 70 active projects. Um, one which had a breakthrough in 2023 
is uh, run by Mary Hagedorn out of the Smithsonian. She studies coral reefs in Hawaii, and they've developed a new cryopreservation method to freeze fragments of corals and revive them for future res restoration. This isn't what we would call a genomic intervention, but it's preparing for being able to do such restorations that will be necessary when we can facilitate adaptation to the threats of climate change. Another large, uh, Big, big success we've had in the recent years is cloning black-footed ferrets, the first clones of a U.S. endangered species. This is one where we're restoring diversity actively rather than preparing for its future. We're doing it right now. We cloned these three animals on the right. This is from our preprint out right now. Um, Elizabeth Ann, Noreen, and Antonia from cells that were cryopreserved in 1988. She's unrelated to all living black-footed ferrets. Her genome has more genetic diversity. So we're adding a new founder into this population. It's an incredible story. So look it up when you have the chance. And this cloning of black-footed ferrets will lead us to be able to facilitate, facilitate adaptation to the disease that's rendering them conservation reliant. So this species went extinct in the wild. The dotted line shows where it used to live. The orange dots show places where it's been reintroduced thanks to successful conservation breeding programs. However, Sylvatic plague introduced on the landscape in the early 1900s and still there today, uh, contaminating their food source and other rodents, has led to most of these sites becoming inactive. Because an outbreak goes through, it kills every black -footed, almost every black-footed ferret. They have no immunity. This is a major barrier to the species making it in the wild. Now, luckily, there is a working vaccine. Every ferret released to the wild is vaccinated for plague. And so they're immune, but they don't pass that immunity on to their wild-born offspring. So ultimately, we can't perpetuate this immunity, and we have to keep vaccinating the species in perpetuity. So one of the ideas we're exploring through our projects at Revive and Restore is turning that injectable vaccine into a genetic vaccine. Very simplified version of this. It actually has something like 20 components, but the very simplified version is that this is a transgene with multiple components that turns on at the right age, the age where a ferret would normally be vaccinated and it turns off after a particular dosage, just like a vaccine, and it is expressed in the muscle tissue, the place where a vaccine would be injected and nowhere else. So it triggers the right immune response, and it's expressing that active ingredient in the vaccine, a V antigen from the plague bacteria, basically creating self-vaccinating ferrets. This has never been done in any vertebrate so far, this type of self-vaccinating tool. We're hoping it works. We're also exploring a number of other options. When it comes to controlling invasives, we have a project that also has a preprint out right now, uh, uh, Mas Ma uh, Macek Maselko, um, working on an alternative to gene drives. So in his figure in the paper, the traditional genetic biocontrol right now, which is also not a gene drive, you release GMO males, they mate with a female, they can continue to spread disease, but when they lay their eggs, it's their larvae that end up having reduced fitness. Well, this spread of disease is what's causing problems. So it's not necessarily that the population, we have to kill the population off to prevent spreading disease, but it's it would be nice if we could just get rid of the females before they bite and spread disease. So he's created this system where the males mate with a female and the female then dies before it has the chance to breed and doesn't live very long so it can't transmit diseases. This is going to be really important for places like Hawaii, where all the native birds now are threatened by the combination of climate change and these invasive mosquitoes that spread avian malaria, pox. Um, they don't spread influenza yet, but there could be an outbreak. Uh, I'm sorry, the new influenza strain is coming possibly to Hawaii, and that'll be really bad. These birds, when they're bitten by mosquitoes, they have virtually no immunity to the diseases they spread, and they ultimately are being found dead all the time. Um, it's a bad situation. Climate change is allowing the mosquitoes to live at higher altitudes every year, have a longer breeding season every year. So there's fewer and fewer safe refuge habitat for the surviving birds. This is a situation where we not only need to find a way to scale up eradicating the mosquitoes in a way that's humane and doesn't kill off native insects, which pesticides would do, but also we may have to look at gene editing the birds to also give them an edge up in a long-term battle to save them. 
ultimately we want to use this toolkit and all these different applications to take this history of human unintended consequences that have led to the loss of biodiversity of where we're at today and see a future where biodiversity rebounds and we live in coexistence and harmony with it. And I think biotechnologies ultimately are gonna be one of the only ways to get us there. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, that was a really great presentation, a really great start to the session. Uh, before we begin our discussion, let's meet the rest of today's panel. We're joined by Bridget Baumgartner, who has worked with Revive and Restore in multiple roles, including as the Director of Research and Development and Program Manager for their Wild Genomes Program. Bridget works closely with Revive and Restore leadership and their Catalyst Science Fund Advisory Council to develop an overarching investment and grant strategy designed to accelerate the creation of impactful innovations in conservation. We're also joined by Lisa Giocomelli from the Fondazione Edmund Mach in Northern Italy. Lisa's research is focused on the elucidation of gene functions in grapevine, where she has pioneered the application of gene editing techniques to enhance tolerance to disease. And our final panelist is Anne Thresher, who is joining us from Stanford University. Anne is a philosopher of science and environmental biotech ethicist who thinks about how to maximize the benefits of science while minimizing the risks. She is a founding member of the New Environmental Biotech Council, consults with the U.S. government on ethics and science policy, and works extensively with scientists and local communities on how to implement scientific technologies in ways that benefit everyone. Welcome, everyone. Following our discussion, we will have an interactive Q&A session with you, the audience. You can ask your questions anytime throughout the talk using the Q&A panel on the side of your screen. Let's start by discussing the increasing concern that the Earth has, that Earth has entered its sixth mass extinction with biodiversity in crisis. This is largely attributed to anthropogenic or human-caused factors, such as land use change resulting in habitat destruction, widespread pesticide and herbicide use, and climate change. What is the role of genomic engineering or genomic intervention in curbing this trend, conserving species and protecting our biodiversity? Lisa, can I ask you to start? Yes, okay. Thank you. Let me tell you a little bit of what I do. So I work as a plant biologist in a small research institute in Northern Italy, which is close to the Austrian border. And uh, our institute is funded by the province. Uh, basically, this means public money, which means that our main goal is to tackle issues that our region is facing. And one big problem we are dealing with is the heavy uh, use of pesticides, uh, especially in grape and apple farming. Um, where I live is a uh, pretty populated area, especially in, uh, down in the valleys. Uh, there are uh, mountains all around. And in the valleys, we have grapevine, grapevine and apple orchards everywhere. And they uh, are very close to people's home. So as a researcher, I'm specifically um, focused on grapevine, but at my institution, uh, working on a small farm. So um, these crops, particularly grapevine and apple uh, trees, are sprayed with, with pesticides more than any other crop in Europe. And just to give you an idea, we are talking about at least 20 rounds of pesticide treatment every year for grapevine alone. Uh, mostly those are fungicides. And on top of that, there are some more eco-friendly uh, treatments like copper sulfate and sulfur. Um, this is not just bad for the environment, it's a serious health uh, risk for people, not to mention how unsustainable this is uh, for viticulture in general. So it comes also uh, at a great cost for the farmers. Um, so me and my colleagues are on a mission to breed for grapevines that are uh, resistant to these uh, diseases. Uh, mainly, we are talking about, about this is because 
um, in order to you know be able to 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 grow those plants um, uh, with a great reduction of the usage of those chemicals. Uh, so cultivated vines, in fact, um, are very susceptible to these pathogens. And while um, we have vi uh, wild vines that are uh, sources to resistant genes, and the way breeders have worked uh, in selecting the, the, the grape vines that we are using for wine and for uh, table grape uh, through uh, centuries has been to crossbreed those uh, wild species into um, our crops, our, our, the one that we cultivate, in, in order to introgress resistant genes. But we are working with a, a species that is a tree. So uh, going from seed to seed is up to uh, some. Therefore, this is a, a very lengthy process. Plus, there is a drawback uh, that um, this tree is highly heterozygous. Therefore, if you cross, let's say, one Chardonnay with another Chardonnay, since you mix the genetic material of the mother and the father, you don't get another Chardonnay. Therefore, the grape varieties that have been selected by humans over centuries and have agronomic properties that are needed to make the wine that we like are lost through, uh, through uh, crossbreeding. But there is another approach, which is gene editing, and this is what I'm specifically working on. Basically, mean, uh, it means that we are uh, tweaking with the vine's uh, DNA um, just a little bit ever so slightly. So we can alter uh, one, two, or a few nucleotides over out of the 500 millions in the genome, preserving in this way the genetic identity of example. And in doing so, we can uh, deactivate those genes in the plant that make the plant susceptible to diseases. For example, those genes that are required for the pathogen to enter the plant, to recognize that they are on a grapevine and then therefore they can infect it. Um, in this way, indeed, we can uh, get uh, plants that are more resilient to pathogens. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and, and you know, in the previous sec uh, session, Jörg Bowman did mention that, you know, the impact of our industries, our agriculture industries, our forestry industries, it's a significant burden to our environment. So it's really great seeing that, you know, we are developing technologies to minimize some of those burdens, such as the pesticide use in the viticulture industry. Um, as a follow-up question, when you go about determining, you know, what is a suitable candidate for this type of gene editing technology, how do you determine uh, you know, what kind of situation, what kind of um, uh, pathogen would work well for this? How did you come to gene editing for this as a solution for uh, your specific mildew resistance? Uh, it, it took uh, decades of research. <laughs> um, so we use transgenic as a case of study um, to knock out uh, one gene of interest and see whether this makes the plant more resistant. Resistant, and then when we have once we have identified the gene, then we do it with a protocol that makes non-transgenic plants. So basically, we create um, a small. Well, we we collect flowers from the Chardonnay plant that we like, for example, and we put them in culture. We create cells uh, that are like the stem cells equivalent. Themselves for a plant. Those cells we can regenerate the entire plant. And then we use the CRISPR Cas uh, gene editing tool, which is a, a ribonucleoprotein. We um, find a way to get it into the cell, uh, do the gene editing, which is a small mutation on a gene that we have previously identified. In this way, we knock it out, we, we disrupt the function. And then from that cells, we regenerate the entire plant, which is identical, but for the mutation that we introduced to the original Chardonnay, Merlot, whatever plant. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I want to move on to Ben. Do you want to 
uh, give us some insights on the role of genomic intervention or genomic engineering in um, curbing the biodiversity loss that we're seeing? Yeah, so, um, you know, I brought up the, the, the situation in Hawaii. Um, it's very urgent. There are species that will be going extinct quickly. Um, probably the only kind of really drawback to genomic interventions currently is from everything from just studying population genomics and adding that information into conservation measures, we're still learning a lot about how genomes work and what aspects of population genomics matter most for populations. So it's we're still researching. It's still taking time to really make real translation at a scale that's necessary. There are a lot of great examples now. But when you start adding on more biotechnology, stem cells, reproductive technologies, gene editing, these are things in routine use for human biomedicine and in agriculture of some species. But we have a big hurdle in developing these for wildlife. So um, right now, the premier example of an actual wild species that's been genetically engineered for conservation is the American chestnut, a tree that lived um, in the Appalachian region of the United States um, in the Eastern US. And it was obliterated by an introduced fungal disease. Um, there are still individuals around, but the species is basically functionally extinct. And the researchers at SUNY ESF in New York um, have created strains that are largely resistant, um, well, tolerant, they can coexist with the fungus without dying. This will probably be the first genetically engineered wild organism for conservation purposes that might make it into the wild. Um, and that's extremely exciting and promising. But for most applications, we can imagine we're still some years away from polishing those up for real wild animal use. And so we need to be doing things right now to prepare for those future genetic intervention options such as biobanking the types of cells that people biobanked decades ago for black-footed ferrets that we use now in cloning. So, so more biobanking, absolutely necessary, and a lot of science to be able to do it better for everything in the world rather than just mammals. Great. Thanks, Ben. Um, Anne, did you want to let us uh, in on some of your perspective on this? And how you feel uh, the role of genomic interventions is going to um, curb biodiversity loss. Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that Ben brought up in his presentation that I think is really important to recognize is that um, we're in the middle of an extinction crisis and a conservation crisis. And things we have are not going to be enough to solve that problem. Um, and there are a lot of traditional techniques that can and are helping with some conservation issues. But uh, given that humans are the source of this uh, crisis, like we've caused this problem, um, as an ethicist, I think a lot about our ethical obligations towards nature. And it's clear we have an ethical obligation to restore these ecosystems in some way, shape or form, to reverse the degradation we've made. Um, and genetic technologies can be a really powerful tool for helping us achieve those goals. Uh, but, uh, there's basically nothing else on the table that can help us in the way that genetic technologies will. Um, as Ben says, a lot of this stuff is very uh, in the works, it's still in lab, we're not ready to roll it out just yet. Um, but uh, the more we can prepare right now for the use of these technologies, the better off we're gonna be. And that looks a lot like developing the technologies. Um, sometimes it looks like preparing policy, preparing the public, for having these kinds of conversations with people to make them aware that these technologies are coming down the line. This, uh, one of the things I think about a lot is how, how science puts a lot of options on the table. Um, it gives us a lot of choices and abilities to act, but if no one picks up those options, if no one does anything with them, it's not helping. Um, and so uh, I think there's a lot of promise, these kinds of technologies, but we have to be ready to use them and use them in ways that are thoughtful um, and careful as we do roll them out. Um, and that looks like figuring out better guidelines, better regulations, and being ready when the time comes to think that we have an ethical obligation to pursue these kinds of approaches. Um, but we also have ethical obligations to think careful about the way that we roll them out. Um, and so it's going to have to be sort of a careful and measured response as we uh, 
start to think about who has the right to release these technologies, right? So the chestnut's a great example of something that I think is really positive, right? We can really restore Native American, or sorry, uh, natural American ecosystems. Like it's a critical species for a lot of other animals. In North America or in the US, like where it's going to get to places like Canada, it might move south, right? You know, whoever's releasing them, it's going to go to other places in the world. And so this has to be part of a broad conversation we're all having and participating in as we think about where and when to deploy these things and under what circumstances. Um, but it's also, I think, important to recognize that many of these techniques can be less damaging, less invasive, less harmful than many of the traditional techniques. You know, when we talk about removing invasive species, um, things that are really harmful, not just for the animals that we're trying to remove, but for native animals as well and dangerous to humans. Um, and so genetic intervention can, in fact, be kinder to the ecosystem um, and to humans than more traditional techniques. Thanks, Anne. That's that's really interesting. And I like how I like how you said that science gives us option. But if no one is using them, you know, we have to think about that more and, and try to find better ways to bring these technologies forward. Um, Bridget, I'm going to ask you to provide any of your insights on that same question? Um, yeah, so I think uh, I agree with just about all of what the, my co-panelists have already said. Um, I think it's important to realize that when we're talking about genomic interventions or genomic technologies for wildlife, um, they're not kind of, they're not all in the same bucket. Um, I see three uh, time horizons for various intervention strategies. Um, things that are ready today, for example, um, are just using genomic information as information, uh, making better decisions, uh, being able to predict uh, outcomes of certain interventions that maybe are more traditional in, in methodology. So adding, for example, genomic information to a captive breeding program. Um, those kind of things can be very powerful. They're ready today. They're not scary. They're not um, messing with genomes that people feel um, one way or the other about. And so I think in the near term, we should be doing much more of that um, because these technologies are available. Um, once we have a better understanding of wild genomics, I would say the next step uh, along with gene editing technologies being you know, becoming more and more reliable um, would be to add back missing genetic diversity, um, the diversity that would have been in the population had, you know, a population not gone through a human uh, caused bottleneck, for example, um, things that um, Revive and Restore is already considering for the Blackfoot and Ferret program, for example, like what, what is the diversity that would have been in the population before the plague outbreak? And then the further horizon uh, is the ability to add biological information that was never in the population in order for to help a population adapt to a new situation like climate change, like exotic disease spread, things that humans are um, particularly good at uh, causing at on timescales that don't really work with evolution. And so I think when we think about these biotechnologies, we need to understand that they're not all happening tomorrow. Um, some of them are, are ready today and very safe and reliable. Uh, others are further out, um, but very powerful and protect and potentially um, going to be important tools in the future. And so, you know, when we're having the kind of conversations that Anne just mentioned, um, it's helpful, I think, to, to keep in mind um, when we're talking about um, something that is still very much in development versus something that um, we can use with great responsibility right now. Excellent. Thank you, Bridget. And on that point, um, so what should we be doing now uh, to prepare for when an intervention is required? And how do we manage the expectations of what, you know, these genomic technologies can bring? Bridget, Ben, anyone on the panel? Uh, well, I well, think... I'll say... Oh, sorry, Bridget. <laughs> No, go ahead. I'll just say simply from a, a non-genetic standpoint um, is uh, uh, something that uh, a fellow scientist of mine is fond of saying is always the low tech trumps the high tech. And in a future where these technologies could be really powerful for restoration, if you want to use 
A, if you want to gene edit anything, you have to have a reproductive technology to turn cells into a viable organism. Um, you need to understand the fundamental reproduction of the organism to be able to develop that tool. Um, it can be really easy to grow cells and gene edit in a Petri dish, or it can be really difficult to just grow the cells too. There can be many aspects of this that have to advance, but one of the basic fundamentals that we need more of in the present to even use the tools that are ready to use better um, is a better fundamental understanding of species, natural history, and ecology. More students out just living with these species in nature and making observations, as well as breeding these organisms in conservation facilities and understanding their biology better. Um, it will always be easier to work with a species if it's still alive somewhere than to try and roll out a biotechnology when every living individual is gone and all you have left are cells in a freezer. No matter how great the tools are, it will be easier if we have species in some capacity still alive. That's a great point, Ben. Does anybody want to add to that? Okay. Um, um, so, oh. Sorry, I just wanted to pause the conversation. I mean, I think one of the things we need to think about as well is how to get policy and regulation in place for these things. Because a lot of it's going to rely on where the public perceives us using these technologies. Um, and so the uh, earlier things about ways to communicate what this technology is, is whichever technologies we're talking about, there's lots of stuff on the table that genetics offers. Um, and so with uh, the public and policymakers and other scientists and other institutions and groups that are working in conservation to prepare them for these kinds of technologies. Um, and I think it's a real benefit for us right now, actually, that a lot of this stuff is still in development because we have the time to have those conversations um, and smooth the way for when we see cases where we need to use these tech. Great. Thank you, Anne. So, Anne, I wanted to ask you what do you think uh, are the, what situations do you think we would see the biggest impact from genomic interventions uh, from your experience? Yeah, this is great. I mean, I think that uh, there's a lot of potential for genetics across a whole range of different conservation spaces. I mean, even on this panel, we've got everyone from Lisa, who works in agriculture, through people at, you know, Ben at Revive and Restore, who are looking at um, endangered species. Uh, invasive species control. Um, I think uh, the potential that genetics have in all those spaces are very high. Um, we just need to be thinking carefully about where we're going to apply them out. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I have more to say beyond just like this is a tech that has a lot of promise um, and we're still figuring out exactly where it can be applied. But from my own perspective, you know, I think a lot about invasive species control. Um, so we can. Uh, use theoretically concepts like gene drives, so uh, genetics that pass down through generations to uh, eliminate invasive species, to leave the worst of the invasive species using genetic technologies. So traditionally we use things like, uh, as I said earlier, poisons, hunting, diseases, um, to try and remove an invasive species from the system somewhere like Hawaii or um, New Zealand or Australia where I'm from, or the US. Um, but the most pervasive invasive species, things like rabbits, um, are uh, incredibly difficult to remove from an ecosystem, with the exception of like small islands. Basically, on a small island, you can maybe remove invasive species, but someone like Australia is just never going to be able to remove rabbits, which decimate our ecosystem. Um, and uh, genetic technologies offer the promise of helping us remove these invasive species um, at large scale, and they're particularly exciting to me because they're good for the most. Um, because of the ways that the uh, genes can pass through a population. It spreads naturally as the animals breed. Um, you can basically insert genes, say, that make all of their offspring male. Um, and in doing so, the population just breeds itself out of existence over time. Um, and you end up being able to restore ecosystems much more effectively in partnership with more traditional techniques like hunting poisons and diseases. Um, we shouldn't use things as like a cure-all, but something that is an extra tool in our Thank you, Anne. Um, ben, can I move to you to answer this as well? 
Yeah, I actually um, want to elevate uh, Lisa's work um, because I think we, we talk in, in my realm at Revive and Restore, we talk a lot about the endangered species themselves and natural ecosystems um, because that's what we focus our funding on. But that future in the slide that's envisioned of coexistence and, and uh, uh, restoring biodiversity will absolutely hinge on improving the efficiency and sustainability and just overall ecology of agriculture. Um, it, engineering agricultural crops is often considered through the lens of feeding a growing human population and human livelihoods, but agriculture is an incredibly antagonistic practice to natural ecosystems globally, has been for thousands of years. Um, and innovation in agriculture is absolutely necessary for it not only to feed us and give us great livelihoods, but to be compatible and allow that coexistence with the natural ecosystems that not only sit right next to our crops and our fields, but imper uh, percolate into them as well. Excellent point. Thanks for that. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about genomic interventions in natural ecosystems being unnatural. Uh, that opens up the question of what is natural versus unnatural. It's an interesting discussion. Um, Bridget, can I go to you for this to start that? Yeah, I, I think it's always interesting when I have, I have the debate of whether or not we should or do we have the right to intervene. I mean, we have intervened in the most unnatural ways all over the world for hundreds of years, <laughs> not necessarily with uh, CRISPR, but with you know every every inch of habitat and climate and um, population genomics has been influenced by human activities uh, in in ways that um, without humans um, probably would have happened. So, so that's my viewpoint. Is you know all natural would be great, um, but I think the ship has kind of sailed on that a long time ago. Not to say that I think that um, there's anything necessarily wrong with intervening for the benefit of the population um, that's being intervened with. Uh, I think the intention behind the intervention is very important. So when we when we accidentally mess up ecosystems, it's not because it's mostly because we're not paying attention, not because we're going out of our way to do so. Sometimes we are going out of our way. But um, I think just I think there's a lot of emphasis placed on the tool uh, and less on 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 the why. Uh, so that's that's my point of view on that. You know, people focus a lot on, especially the the human food supply. Uh, is that natural, unnatural to have GMO food, for example? And I just you know like to point out that you, the the whole process of domesticating a species so that we can raise it in a farm was a, geno a genetic intervention at a, like a huge massive scale. Hundreds and hundreds of genes are, are selectively bred for um, to produce a species that would never have occurred in nature. There's nothing natural about the species that we grow. They would never survive the wild, right? So, um, so anyway, that's my perspective on, on the unnatural versus natural. Thanks, Bridget. Lisa, can I go to you? Oh, <laughs> and uh, fruits uh, exists in the wild. Well, not, nothing is probably too uh, strict, but most of what we eat doesn't exist, wouldn't exist if uh, men and women haven't uh, uh, didn't breed for it. I mean, uh, did some of you ever saw a um, wild apple i mean they are this big they are ugly <laughs> and they would not feed the planet and the same stands for um, cereals and um, grapevine for sure so we can feed ourselves uh, the number we are uh, today because we have technology and we have used it since we became farmers yeah, and, and I just wanted to follow up on um, kind of the way that Italy is moving forward with kind of re 
thinking how we approach uh, these type of technologies. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Um, so, okay. Um, well, Italy and Europe, actually, uh, because we, we <laughs> try to be in the same, on the same uh, road. Um, so there is now the European Commission that is um, um, discriminating between what has been uh, produced through transgenesis, so DNA that has, ins has been inserted into a plant, uh, a crop, and whatever is instead um, the product of just a small modification. So nothing has been introduced. So we are um, mutating like nature is doing naturally. You know, we are mimicking nature in this. So we in a very specific nature process. Every time it provokes a mutation, um, for example, the, the, the white um, grape that we eat is a mutation from the red grape. So it's, it's white because a natural mutation occurred. And we have been eating uh, white grape since, I don't know, centuries and centuries. Um, so in trying to mimic this, we do something that is kind of mimicking nature and legislation is trying to understand this. So the plant is pretty much the same as the natural plant that we cultivate, but we have introduced a mutation that is very small, let's say one, two nucleotides, over 500 millions of uh, nucleotides that are in the grapevine genome. So this is different. Therefore, regulation should be different. And Europe and Italy are in total but a discussion. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, Anne, did you want to pipe in on the natural versus unnatural discussion? Yeah, I mean, this is a conversation that's been happening in departments in uh, environmental ethics spaces for a very long time. Um, what constitutes natural, what constitutes unnatural. Um, I think my own opinion on this is that uh, to pick up on some of the stuff that Bridget was saying, uh, it's unclear to me that this constitutes a less natural intervention than any of the other interventions we're already doing. So um, the ecosystems we've decimated are no longer in a natural state. Um, that's the problem. Um, we've gone in and destroyed a lot of stuff. Solutions that are already on the table, the more traditional solutions, don't look that natural either. So uh, Australia, for example, is looking to get rid of the European carp, which is massively invasive in a lot of our waterways and doing incredible amounts of damage to our natural ecosystem. Some of the most biodiverse parts of Australia are being decimated by the European carp. And uh, the current best solution on the table, the one they're considering doing, is releasing a disease into the ecosystem that will kill off huge but uh, that's an intervention, right? This disease doesn't exist in that ecosystem. So we're porting in from another part of the world. Um, on top of that, when we release the disease, it won't kill all of them. There's a strong evolutionary pressure for the carp to develop resistances to the disease. And so what's likely to happen is we're gonna genetically change those carp, right? They'll develop resistances. Um, mass numbers of carp will die off. We'll see a lot of death in this way. It'd be a terrible way to kill them all. Um, run, we're still going to have carp in the ecosystem. They're going to be genetically different than they were before because of these resistances. Conversely, we can think about uh, genetic interventions that uh, go in and say, again, help us control or remove the carp from the ecosystem using genetic techniques. Now, uh, it's really unclear to me that that's less natural than like introducing an artificial disease that will genetically change the carp anyway. Um, and in fact, I think it's likely to be much kinder to these carp because we're not killing them incredibly painful and miserable way for them to die. Um, and so like, I think this pattern can be found lost around a lot of cases when it comes to genetic intervention. It's often not clear that what we're doing is less natural than what we're already planning on doing in these spaces. Um, and so uh, I, I think that we should be looking very seriously and, and worries that we're doing something unnatural. Um, yeah, it, it just, I don't think it's quite the right way to think about these kinds of technologies. Now I will say the one way that I do it's a unnatural way, 
but then we need to be careful about how much genetic engineering we're doing, right? But I don't see it as a problem right now, right? If we're going and we're just like willy-nilly changing whole ecosystems using genetic engineering, maybe that's a reason to be cautious about these things. But that's just not what the plans are, and that's not how we're thinking about technologies. Um, in fact, I think they're going to help us restore these things to more natural states. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think we're going to transition to the Q&A portion since we have about 10 minutes left in our session. And there's some great questions from the audience that are in the queue. So let's dive in. Uh, the first question is, when restoring an ecosystem, how do we prevent designing an ecosystem that is not what the actual structure in terms of species or genetics uh, would have been before disruption? Uh, I don't know that it's always necessarily the goal to go back to the period before disruption, only because that those that situation doesn't exist anymore. You want an ecosystem that is resilient and robust to the current situation. And so I think I, I'm in favor of not not taking a heavy hand and rationally designing an ecosystem, but setting up the situation that evolution can do its thing, right? So you need enough complexity to start um, a functional system, but then that system should be allowed to evolve towards a um, more adaptive state um, based on the current climate, which obviously has changed substantially in the last several hundred years, or even the last hundred years. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Um... Any other comments on that one? Uh, when, I, when I present to students and, and the public at large, I, I have a set of slides about species reintroductions um, because I think a lot of times people think there's an element of time and stability to ecosystems in ways that are somewhat um, too simple, simple to look at. And sometimes you can reintroduce a species that's been missing from an environment when it's been missing for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, these have been done. And people have to really think of the state of ecosystems, as Bridget said, as to what is resilient to the current state now. But when you look at deep time, you know, look at an ecosystem over the last several hundred thousand years, rather than just the last couple hundred. Because there are organisms and environments that live for hundreds to thousands of years, certain types of trees. When you look at in that deep time, you'll see patterns within an ecosystem that there's always an apex predator, there's always a primary uh, consumer, there's always certain roles that are filled in certain ways. And while ecosystems may change and fluctuate to stimulus, they reach certain type of, types of stable states. And it's not necessarily about the species that are in it, but it's about the roles being played. And, and if we look at that deep time and look at how it's changed over time, we can draw upon what kind of roles used to work in the past when the, the conditions were similar to today. And we can also look at ecosystems around the world to say what would really work today. And the beautiful thing we have now is the ability to not only look at the fossil record of what this, these ecosystems have been over time, but be able to take bits of tissue from that fossil record or museum specimens and sequence their DNA and actually get a glimpse of how population genetics of each population has changed over time. So while I agree with Bridget, the idea is never really to go back to a baseline. When your baseline becomes an average of a very deep section of time, then you have something that you can really work with. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, our next question is, how would indigenous communities feel about genetic engineering of culturally significant areas or organisms using non-traditional methods um, and authenticity concerns? Um, and maybe I'll start with you on this one. Sure. Um, so I think the answer to that is it depends. Um, different communities have different opinions, different ideas about how they want to uh, use and roll out these technologies. Uh, some uh, traditional communities are very against genetic engineering. Um, some are very for it. Um, there's uh, arguments being made on both sides. Some people see it as intervention, um, especially in communities that tend to see ourselves as continuous with nature rather than separate from it. They think that things we would do to nature, uh, so we shouldn't do to nature what we wouldn't do to people. 
basically. Um, and if we're not okay with the kind of genetic modifications that we're talking about on people, we shouldn't be doing it to animals, for example. And like, that's one. Um, see some of these things as uh, perhaps decolonization of certain spaces, right? So colonization happens, it uh, changes the ecosystems. Um, and some communities see this as a way of, it's a tool of reverting back to the ecosystems prior to colonization. Um, and so they're very on board for these kinds of approaches. Um, and it really, as with any group, there's not sort of one homogenous answer to this. It really depends on who you're talking to. Um, I uh, want to use these technologies. Um, and so, yeah, in some cases, very against it. In other cases, very pro these kinds of tech. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I have a question here that's specifically for Lisa. Uh, the gene editing grows new improved vines, but does that mean all the heirloom vines would eventually be replaced or destroyed? Um, I don't know what heirloom Vines uh, are? Uh, I guess Sorry. that those are more the traditional varieties. Well, yeah, but um, so uh, the vines that we cultivate are not the wild uh, species, if that is what you are referring to. So we have wild species, but um, and they are, um, they can cross to each other, but um, they wouldn't give, I mean, the, the vine that we produce are so susceptible to pathogens that un, unless there is a farmer that takes care of them, they will never um, colonize uh, the territory and take over wild species, if, that is, if I understood correctly the, the question. Yeah, I guess so. I guess that brings up another interesting point about safeguards when working with these technologies. and. And you know, if you use gene drives with your specific species or any specific species, what kind of safeguards are being put in place to ensure that you know we don't have gene flow or hybridization with um, uh, other members of the ecosystem? Does anybody want to touch on that? Well, you know, I can just add that at the moment. Sorry. Uh, that at the moment, all the products that we make in the lab, we are not really allowed to put them in the field. So this is in Italy, there is still, um, you know, and in Europe, this is not accepted. Um, okay. But, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, Anne, there's a question for you. How do you envision multi-jurisdictional issues, uh, specifically thinking about the restoration of monarch butterflies? Oh, interesting. Um, right now, it's something that I think we're just starting to be on the cusp of thinking through on a global scale. Um, so the way that the EU is handling genetic technologies, which Canada's doing is we're doing Australia is doing it on New Zealand. New Zealand's very pro a lot of genetic technologies, places like the EU are not. Um, and so these multi-jurisdictional questions are going to have to come into effect quite early on in the process. Um, it'll probably look like a lot of uh, international or inter-regional uh, look like uh, proactive thinking through the laws and regulations for deployment. It'll look like agreements um, in place. It'll look like partnerships. Um, but we're really very early on in this process, um, and it's going to be probably a while before we sort of hash out the real details here. And unfortunately, a lot of regulation and policy is reactive rather than proactive. And so I suspect what's going to happen is we're going to start seeing some of the things deployed, and then we're going to see people going back and retroactively trying to figure out what better um, going forward. And so it's all sort of up in the air right now. And that's kind of one of the exciting things actually is we get to figure out what this should look like and how we can make the most of these technologies. Um, but it's clear it's gonna to have to be big conversations across a bunch of refiltrators from the scientists to politicians, to the public, to indigenous groups, to you know, uh, ethicists like myself. Thanks, Anne. Uh, we have another question about the woolly mammoth. Um, so this will probably be for Ben and Bridget. What has been the impact of focusing on de-extinction of the woolly mammoth? Um, and what has what impact has that had on the, the legitimate efforts to use biotechnology and biodiversity conservation? 
I'm so happy that question didn't include the words Jurassic Park. Um, <laughs> so I think de extinction projects in general, uh, not just Willie Mammoth, um, they're kind of like moonshot ideas, right? The amount of technology that's going to be required to, to even conceive of a transgenic elephant, which is what the, the extincted mammoth would be, are just enormous advances, right? Anything from how do we do that? How do we know what edits to make in a genome? How do we um, how do we predict what the phenotype would be for a given genotype before even seeing the animal? Um, how do we get the reproductive technology so that um, you can carry a, an elephant to term in some way, either in vivo or in vitro? So all of these things, all of these technologies um, are the same technologies that you saw in the genetic rescue toolkit. And um, they will have um, just as much impact, if not more, on extant species that, that need genetic rescue. So I think, um, you know, the de-extinction projects, even though they are, you know, very sensationalized, um, really serve as, um, as a way of mobilizing funding and um, efforts around those, tech, those core technologies that we need for, for conservation. Ben might have a different take on that. <laughs> Well, I, uh, um, I I also somewhat chuckle a bit because uh, uh, while well, the question's clearly loaded, um, the real question is what is legitimate conservation? Um, so if you rewind the clock several decades, zoos were not legitimate conservation, even though many zoos were trying very hard to help endangered species most people in the field of conservation and most people in the public would not have considered a zoo like San Diego Zoo or the Bronx Zoo um, as conservation organizations or a conservation tool. Um, when the California condor was going extinct in the wild, there was an entire group that organized um, that called themselves Extinction with Dignity, and they were completely opposed to bringing condors into zoos and breeding them to save them. Um, and, you know, a really nice part of that story is several decades later, um, the last California condor taken out of the wild, um, because they're such long lived species was actually after he produced a lot of babies to repopulate his species, his name was Igor, um, he got to go back to the wild and they witnessed him training captive born condors in how to be wild condors. It was really incredible. And at that event, the people that were originally against zoo breeding of condors met with all of the other partners to release Igor back to the wild. And it was a reconciliation moment. Um, every new tool is seen as illegitimate compared to what people believe are proven. And so de-extinction seems to a lot of people like this bizarre, uh, you know, hyper -sens sensationalized concept. We have already been reintroducing locally extinct populations across the globe for over a hundred, actually, when it comes to beaver reintroductions, 200 years now. Um, we're just now adding biotechnology to expand a practice that already exists. So if those biotechnology tools work, it's automatically legitimate in conservation. But Every new tool has to prove itself. Um, I'm happy to say that I can't speak for mammoths. We don't work on mammoths. I do believe mammoth de-extinction is an extremely relevant and legitimate conservation program. Um, I work on passenger pigeons, and I will simply say that we try not to sensationalize our passenger pigeon de-extinction efforts, um, but we, I believe, are on track to try and recreate our birds sometime between 2029 and 2035. And then it'll be decades of tried and true legitimate conservation measures to breed them and measure their impact in ecosystems as we slowly reintroduce them and monitor them, et cetera, as we have now done with several dozen species to great effect over the decades, if not hundreds now across the globe. Thank you, Ben. Um, and Thanks to all of the panel. Thank you um, for sharing your expertise and insights. 
Uh, also, thank you to the audience for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation. We're going to wrap the session, and I'm going to hand over to Genome BC's Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Federica De Palma, for some final thoughts. Thank you.